Okay, so recording. So today's session uh, and to this week, this Saturday actually starts one week of development on the CNC torch table. The end goal is to produce a, kit, a workable kit. So we've had several prototypes of the CNC torch table already starting in 2011 or 20, not 2009. Let's go to the CNC torch table genealogy. But idea here is what, why do you want a torch table? A torch table is a machine that cuts flat sheets of steel or tubing uh, patterns, computer controlled patterns of any geometry. So for example, things like our brick press uh, currently our CNC cut. Now right now we get that outsourced by another another person but any any complex geometries you want to cut out of metal that's the CNC torch table. Why do an open source CNC torch table? Well you can buy one off the shelf for about ten thousand bucks or up. Here we're gonna show up a, a way to build that also for high performance using the universal axis and universal controller that we have for about a thousand dollars in price, so about 10x uh, high performance it means uh, oxyacetylene torch, which can cut readily up to seven inches of steel thickness. So that's no joke. Um, and why oxy fuel? Oxy fuel compared to plasma, plasma or laser or water jet. Well, you're talking about much higher costs there. Plasma cutters cannot get you at low cost to get you more than about one inch or so of cutting thickness. So for example, if you wanted to cut three inch thick steel, forget about it with a plasma cutter unless you want to pay ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars for the plasma cutter machine itself, the actual torch. So oxy and fuel torch torches are very inexpensive. It's a it's a handle. It's essentially gas bottles and a and a torch cutting handle. So what we will do this week is is devise a system that that uses this uh, torch handle oxy fuel so oxy oxy acetylene oxygen and acetylene to do that uh, using already off the shelf well already prepared techniques like we've got the universal axis at one inch we've got the universal controller for the cnc control so we're going to actually use uh, the tool chain of marlin and Cura and the universal controller. So I'll show that. Marlin and Cura is our universal tool set for 3D printing, so why not build more applications on top of that since that's a ready controller that we can use uh, for many applications, not just the 3D printers. The, the software as is lends itself to, to doing anything in, in flat dimensions as well. For 3D printing, the, the software tool chain gets you three-dimensional 3D prints, but you can do very simple, simple things as well using Marlin Cura. Right now we're using Lulzbot Cura, uh, the stock Marlin. Uh, into the CNC torch table, we're also going to have to add a couple of other other tools. Probably uh, FlatCam, which is an open source software for generating G codes from flat drawings. We can do the initial CAD within FreeCAD, for example. So FreeCAD can get you to exports of DXF files, which are the cutting files for steel. Uh, or we can use things like Inkscape, which is a drawing program. So if you put your, you can do your designs there, but that doesn't have really CAD functionality. So you'd want to go, if you want to do a, some precise shape that you're trying to figure out the exact geometry of, you probably want to go to FreeCAD, draw it up in a sketcher use that tool chain to get all the dimensions and then export it to DXF. DXF goes to FlatCam. FlatCam goes into G-Code export for, well, you don't have to use Cura. You use the SD card so you, you can export that G-Code, I believe, from FlatCam directly to an SD card that you plug into our universal controller and have the torch table cut. So that's, that's what I'm seeing here. We haven't done that full tool chain for CNC torch table yet. Um, I think flat cam, and we'll, we'll see if that's the way to go, but I think flat cam is probably the deal where you've got two dimensional uh, two dimensional cuts, cutting files that you export directly into G code. The system currently, what we do, you can either plug in with a USB cord or an SD card into the universal controller. So let's, let's get into some of the design docs here. So let's take a look at uh, you can go to 
on the Wiki CNC Torch Table Genealogy. And on the Genealogy, the latest version which we started here is CNC Torch Table version 19.10. So that's October 2019. There's a design document there and also some, some files already. So what you'll see that's happening there, let's actually share the screen. You guys can follow on Jitsi as well if you want to see my screen share. So this is the page CNC Torch Table 19.10. You have a part library there and this is the one inch universal axis. So for reference, if you go to the universal axis page, you will see the fu full documentation of what we've done so far. So we started with the eight millimeter axes that we've done a lot for the 3D printers. We also have so built larger printers. We also built one inch universal axes. So last year, or was it 2017, we did a build, when is this, two years ago, we did a build of a one inch universal axis for a, a larger uh, CNC torch table, which was five by 10, that was our prototype. Before that, we've done a torch table. So let's actually go back to the history when we go into torch table genealogy just to show what work has been done so we're building upon open source industry standards here so at the genealogy page first one was CNC torch table one and I'll prototype one so let's go through that uh, you can see the video yes we've used it we cut actually when we had a production run of the four tractors that was back in, uh, if you go view history here, 2011. Uh, back in 2011, as I see the, was featured in Make Magazine here. But we cut a bunch of parts like wheel plates. Basically, geometries where you either measure for hours or you have this cut in five minutes. Um, the idea about CNC work is that you can cut out ready geometry without having to measure. When you talk about welding, uh, assembling things from metal most of the time is actually measuring things and figuring out what what things are so actually to weld or to actually do the cutting if you have the markings that's pretty easy but how do you get the markings well the computer does does that for you you can um, do that with CNC that's the case so that's that's how it looks in the make make magazine that was our first table we used exactly that at that point we used Linux CNC meaning we didn't use USB ports we used uh, a serial port RS-232, uh, but very few computers have that kind of port, uh, very few laptops have that these days, so we're switching to um, be on Linux CNC. Linux CNC is a favorable project, that is fully open source and definitely can get you this kind of control, but if we want to integrate with the 3D printer tool chains and other tool chains that we've already done, like, like the circuit mill from a couple of years ago too, um, then we use the Marlin as the firmware using the same tool chain as the 3D printer since we've done a lot of work on the 3D printer we build around that tool chain so that <clears throat> that print printer uh, printer that that torch table has been used primarily in a production run of um, the tractors where we cut out a bunch of wheel plates so we had a several aborted versions since then which we actually never used we prototyped various aspects of the system but torch table 2 uh, actually was never built. We have a design there. We did build 1708. That was, you can call that prototype 3. Uh, so 1708. Uh, we called that the D3D CNC torch table. Uh, D3D refers to our universal axis. D3D we mean the distributed 3D printer kind of uh, the universal axis. But if you look at that, so yeah we did build this, it was a 5 by 10 structure. Here we're using 1 inch uh, rod pieces and 3D printed pieces with tiny NEMA 17 motors. So this was actually altogether great proof of concept. We hung a torch on it, this thing moves around. Structure wasn't stable enough so we never ended up using this. But the concept is, is sound. Uh, here you have an example of how you can hang uh, on a one-inch axis, you can hang the small 
universal axis because they're all interchangeable parts. But yeah, that was great. We, you can see how a uh, pretty good structure can be made. What we did notice, one of the parts is uh, it's very good to go with up to like about five feet with a one inch universal axis, but beyond that, so in the length, length axis, as you see in the picture there, uh, the 10 foot long axis, it starts to sag a little bit and wobble a little bit. So when you get to lengths like 10 feet with a solid shaft, just the weight of the shaft makes it actually bend under its own weight. So a solution for a system like that is using something like one inch pipe, which uh, schedule 40 pipe as the rails where that doesn't bend on its under its own weight. Even though it's a hollow tube, it's actually structurally more sound for this application because it doesn't droop under its own weight. Uh, now it might be acceptable to, that you have a droop because of auto height correction, which where you're tracing the level of the of the cut workpiece, uh, but we want more stability. So based on the learnings from the last prototype. Uh, we didn't get to the automatic ignition and, and auto gas control at that prototype. We had motion um, and tested the motion out. And learning from that, we decided to go to a modular system. Now, because 5 by 10, that gets some, to some serious size. And we were also thinking about, well, how do you get more people ac participating with us on a smaller scale? So how about making a modular system that's based on 5 by 5 modules? that are then stackable to 5x10, five 5x15, by five by any length you want. It's a little more tricky to get like say 10x10, 10 10, but typically like the, the sheets in America, the largest ones that are practical to work with are about <coughs> 5 by 10 feet. Uh, this is what this could handle. But let's start with a 5, so, so this time around we'll do a minimum viable prototype for cutting 4x8 foot sheet sheets of steel. Uh, so a 5x5 five five structure that's modular that with very minimal modification you can turn it from 5 feet to 10 feet long and the 5 foot allows us to prototype it faster and shake down all the systems like the auto ignition and auto gas system so the, the fuel system you have to in order to do efficient for efficiency or maybe eco we're gonna have three on off switches for gas, so naturally you would have the cutting oxygen if you're leaving, if you're doing oxy fuel. What you have is oxygen and acetylene mixed together. Uh, you can just light the acetylene. That's that's just the acetylene channel. You can mix some oxygen with that to get a flame that's clean because the the acetylene flame is going to be yellow and smoky. So you add oxygen to that, and that turns into a hot flame. And then the third item is a cutting oxygen lance, in other words, a, a stream of higher pressure oxygen that goes down the nozzle that then cuts. Because the way cutting works, you heat up the metal to red hot and white hot, and then you turn on the cutting oxygen. And that oxygen just oxidizes and burns everything through with a lot of sparks. So that's, that's the way the oxyacetylene works. And the next step after this, next prototypes here, would be oxyhydrogen which is a cleaner, faster cut, more sustainable too, because you can generate oxyhydrogen from splitting water. So that's also part, would be part of an off-grid microfactory that's doable wherever there is not even the gas supply chains. You, you generate your oxygen and hydrogen on demand from water using electricity, so, uh, which is uh, actually, if you look at the history of, of oxy, oxy fuel cutting, it started with hydrogen. If you didn't know that, if you look at the history, mm -hmm. uh, hydrogen was the first fuel because hydrogen was easy to get. You just split water. Uh, it took, took some more decades before acetylene came about, which is a, you have to make in a chemical process. So, yeah, uh, that's the deal. So let's take a look at, so that's, uh, this prototype, that was uh, two years ago, October 2017. So just about two years ago, we did that in a small workshop. Now we're going to the next version. So let's go into on the genealogy page you can link to the cnc torch table 1910 uh, so in the part library this all free cad so you got the one inch universal axis pieces also have the torch catted up 
in there. I just borrowed that from GrabCAD. So let's go into the design document and see what's what's going on in there to so we can design and build it. What we're doing in the process here is spending, so we have a week of budgeted time for this, so we're going to spend the first two days doing the CAD uh, based off the conceptual designs that we have here using already made part libraries, so we'll convert them into full axes and a full accurate geometry that we would like to use. Now, um, one thing I would point out is, okay, let's think about the modularity aspect in a serious way. Uh, that's um, and I'm actually glad to, to show that this 5x5 five five scalable torch tables, you'd, you'd think like, okay, well, how are you going to do that? You actually have a waterbed in there. So we're designing a waterbed, so all the smoke and heat is trapped in a waterbed. Well, how do you connect two of these together? Listen up to this uh, conversation and we'll find out. There's, there's actually some good ways to make that happen, that it, with minimal modification, you can scale completely with in a sense that no it's not some heroic effort to join two of them like sometimes you might hear oh you can make this bigger you can stack it no here we're talking about minimal absolute minimal effort um, that it becomes a practical thing that you would want to start with a five by five as entry level uh, get going with that make some money and then buy yourself the next section so you got a full five by ten for industrial productivity or five by fifteen if you want so you can work on multiple sheets at a time or whatever um, so let's take a look at this. Uh, the other thing that we learned recently from the 3D printer is, um, uh, let me show you the frame here, but we've got, if you look at this kind of frame here, we started to use uh, 3D printed corners and pieces that allow you to hang components onto a frame. So I would actually suggest, like since, since we've done that over the last week or two, uh, I would also suggest <coughs> that the axis system on this big torch table we hang it using 3d printed parts uh, there's different ways we'll go through this in detail here but i would actually suggest that because that gives you absolute flexibility in a case of using uh hanging pieces that you attach to a frame pretty much by snapping in you don't have to drill any holes in metal uh, holes in metal are not not an easy thing you either have to torch them you might, uh, you can drill them with a mag drill or with a one inch drill bit. If you drill with a one inch drill bit, say in quarter inch steel, you can't really do that. You have to start with a smaller hole like half inch and then go up three quarter, maybe one, because you'd rip them, it just doesn't work that well. Um, okay, but if you can avoid holes in metal, that's a lot of work. And the other part about holes is they gotta be exactly at the right place, otherwise things won't fit. So if you use a design where you're hanging things onto the frame, that gives you absolute flexibility for prototyping and for real use. And in the case of the current 3D printer, we're actually hanging the Z axes, uh, so they're fle you can flexibly move them side to side. So as we go further, we go more and more into easy modularity construction set approach, which we're known for, uh, and making that absolutely practical, practical, even at the larger scale of a torch table. Now, the other way to do that is use weldments and holes uh, but in this time around uh, we don't have that detail drawn in I would suggest we actually look at a way to hang it because 3d printing now we've got uh, the new OSE extruder with uh, a simple one that if you use one millimeter nozzles like 0.8 or or one millimeter nozzles those parts that are that would fit around four by four inch tubes they would print fast in an hour or two if you've got a one millimeter nozzle, um, volcano heater block, so you're you're printing about five pounds per day uh, print rates, according to the other lecture on the the, econ the economics of 3D printing. So production rates uh, using standard off-the-shelf printers these days, commonly accessible, you can print f about five pounds of plastic per day. So if you think about uh, hung pieces on a, on a frame, maybe it's like a half a pound. So it's going to take you a few hours. Uh, if you have multiple printers, you can uh, go from the CAD to the prototypes uh, on day time scales or hour time frames. So it could become a real real time prototyping exercise, but you can't use your 0.4 millimeter nozzles. Uh, the speed of printing goes as uh, R squared. The, the, 
the radius of the nozzle squared or diameter squared. So for example, for a 0.4 nozzle, if you were to compare that to a 1.2 millimeter nozzle, what's the difference? It's nine times, four, it's four squared versus, it's three times larger. So it, so it goes as three squared, so nine. You're printing nine times faster, so way, way faster. Uh, so let's do that. Let's, let's go into the dock. Um, let me share my screen again here and explain so the design rationale for how this torch table is coming together. So first of all, we're designing this to be not only for production right now, for, but also to make it easy to produce kits. So there's a big heavy frame. You know, we may ship that as a complete kit. That would be freight, like heavy freight. So pretty much like 500 bucks or so for shipping this, say, anywhere in, around the States using freight trucks. Because uh, this thing will be uh, five by five modules. Uh, that's sizable and heavy. Um, probably like 500 pounds for the finished machine. 500 to 1,000 pounds or something to that effect. Don't know the details yet. Uh, we're going to build this around five, a quarter, quarter inch wall, four by four tubing, of which we have plenty of supply. So we can weld a frame out of that. But when we do this, we'll think about how do we make this easy to kit, so uh, easy to assemble, so, so you can do this both in so-called centralized production or distributed production, or we ship out kits that are easy to build. And once again, it's very easy to build. Hung parts, universal axes, well-prepared modules, and all that. So the invitation for anyone who's listening to this is also, we're doing this this whole week, so if you have CAD skills for free cat or you want to contribute to the design doc you're welcome to do so we invite that and all of this by all means will be open source completely um, CC by SA license so contribute to this if you'd like okay um, so kits um, let's talk about the torch handle so Let's, or let's talk about maybe overall design. So uh, on slide 10 or slide, slide 11, uh, so let's talk about the 5x5 five five modules. So what will we have there? So the frame, the, there's a, let's see, where's the basic frame example? So, so say page 10, the frame is made of 4x4 uh, four four tubing. And the concept here is that, that I'm trying to point out to is we can make a separate gantry and a separate waterbed. So both of these two need to be pretty heavy. So the structure needs to happen for the gantry because you need precise motion, relatively precise. I mean, we're, we're about precision. We're talking up to like one or th one to three millimeters precision, like one eighth, one six, not not one eighth, less than that, one sixteenth about so about 1.5 millimeter precision uh, is all we ever need for CNC torch cutting uh, due to the curve of torch cutting itself 1 16th would be fine um, or even even 1 32nd for smaller nozzles so you're talking plus minus 1.5 or plus minus 0.3 millimeters um, so think about 16th <coughs> to 1 one thirty second inch. Um, but you need to hang the gantry on a, on a solid foundation, so a solid frame. So the 4x4 four four tubing absolutely gets you to that. Uh, you can hang the gantry, no problem with that. At the 5x5 five five scale, a simple four-sided structure, not even a brace in the middle, simple four-sided structure, easy enough to hang a frame, uh, hang the gantry on it. Uh, super simple okay great what about the bed now the bed is actually where you're gonna need to have more strength why why is that it's going to spoil the, gantry. Uh, the gantry is the lightweight part but what about the metal that you're gonna put on it so we're talking yeah, about putting up to like yeah, okay. common will be half inch steel so if you if you've got a four by four foot piece of half inch steel Half inch weighs 20 pounds per square foot. So you're talking about <clears throat> in the 4x4 version, 
320 pounds that are resting on the table if you're doing half inch steel. That's going to be the common use case, say for making tractor parts, brick press parts. But that's of course not all. If you're going to be building an iron worker machine, you're going to be talking about three inch steel. And three inch steel is going to be 1,800 pounds per four by four sheet. So you're talking track loading yeah. with a track. So, so in other words, what I'm trying to say here is that the base, the waterbed section, that part is going to be extra heavy duty. So if we use quarter inch four by four steel, yeah, that's getting like 2000 pounds on that. Yeah, I think we can do that quite readily. We might need a brace down the middle uh, at, for the waterbed part, uh, but that's, that's the idea. Think about strength. Now we have the other option of using half inch wall four by four tubing that exists readily off the shelf too. Uh, but I think with quarter inch four by four tubing, thousand pound scale weights using just a simple four by four foot frame, external four pieces of metal just welded together. Cannot get any simpler than that. So what about the waterbed? So if you look at the design on page 10, you see the blue is on top. Um, why? Um, why is that as opposed to in the middle it, it, like at the bottom bottom of it there's there is a reason for that so I, I started on page 13 with this kind of design here uh, so I was thinking okay how do we do this monolithic structure the details come in when you talk about scaling the two pieces putting the two pieces together uh, the concept is if the waterbed were at the bottom there's no easy way to join two five, five by five sections next to each other. You'd always have that rib in the middle uh, the, the, between the two sections. You got to put the water on top. Um, so think about that, but let's start yeah, with that. The weight of the water is, yeah. weight of the water is not, yeah, not, not too high. Yeah, no, so no not too high. Like a thin wall, uh, so, so let's think about this. So, so far we have a four by four structure. We're, we're going to have to put a sheet of metal on that, like say eighth inch, three millimeter sheet uh, on top of that to support the water. Uh, what I also have there is you see the three on page 10. These, let me uh, zoom into that. Uh, if you guys can see my screen, you guys looking yeah. at my screen, look at these pieces there. So if you've got this sheet of metal upon which the water rests, I mean, water gets, that's going to be hundreds of pounds still for water. So you want to have a support. So I was thinking that angle there, you have uh, support angles welded to the underside, like in between the frame section. Mm -hmm. So you support the, the sheet. Now on top, what are those other pieces? Those are going to be the actual rests upon which the metal will rest. So I'm thinking right now, they don't have to be welded. They can lay there actually. And you can replace them yeah. very easily. Yeah, actually, that's, that's exactly right. Uh, and what I was thinking also, there's a detail on these material holders. Uh, let's see, do I have that somewhere here? Let me zoom back out. There's a detail on that. In order to save those, because yes, you can replace them easily, but let's make them get eaten up uh, less fast. Uh, so there is, there's the detail on page 20. Do a little offset. So put a little piece of metal so that the, the work piece is not resting directly on the eighth inch. So here I put eighth inch by three inch support angle. Um, now eighth inch by three inch, that won't hold two inch steel. That might be, this might be like limit, might be half inch steel here. Uh, so you can use a stronger su <coughs> support piece, but basically put on, put on a little, um, little angle piece offsets. So, so when you're cutting, you're not cutting your support angle. You're just here and there cutting these little sacrificial stubs, like maybe one inch long, um, which you can readily replace. And because you're cutting into the water, pretty much that support angle, you're not gonna destroy that. You're not gonna touch that um, because of that little water layer. It's easy to cut things that are touching, but once there's a space of either air or especially water, you're not gonna, in this design here, you're not gonna be cutting into the one eighth inch support angle. Uh, so that's great. Uh, more details. So let's let's talk more about the design of the the bed itself. So 
So here's the scaling consideration. So we talked about this five by five inch table. We said the water's on top. You've got the support angles, both under the sheet of steel. Now, how do you make the water bed? That would be just a simple, like a two inch or three inch, um, one eighth inch steel that's welded on all the edges. So if you're gonna put two of these together, uh, look what has to happen. On a five by 10 table, you simply weld the four by fours so this is the tubing and you the rip out the one side the moment, yeah. oh you can't see it yeah should be able to see it um yeah, I can follow it yeah so I on know. slide number 11 if you look at the the weld there's what there's what's happening so one you're gonna weld the strong four by four frames together and you will take out one side of the waterbed so that you can weld the waterbeds together because that that's a has to be leak tight so you just weld that together. so basically you're welding the two torch table sections together which is i mean that's that's easy you just lay them right next to each other and weld them to get a five five by ten table and the waterbed it, it has to be connected so you gotta break one side of the waterbed which is uh, doable now there's other let's let's talk about more details so how does this structure get uh, connected between the gantry part and the water table part because we're talking here like super modular and so forth uh, all there is is a, I'm, I'm putting in a removable spacer it could be a either like the tubing itself. So we have to think about it a little bit. In there, I put actually an eight by 16 inch metal plate. Um, in order to bond those two together, you'd have to, there you would kind of have to drill holes unless we hang them by plastic pieces, but plastic around flaming parts, mm. it's not good. So probably there we use metal. You could either use like the tubing, you can use a section of tubing because all you need to do is lift it enough above the bed so that the torch head could move up and down um, just a little bit for however large a work piece you want to work and I would say we can design it for work pieces up to like say six inches or whatever six inches tall so for example if you want to cut a six inch tube on one side you can do that but typically you're gonna be like half an inch work work piece height for half inch steel that is very common to work with here um, so, so there's a removal spacer so in a 5 by 10 version that spacer is either bolt-on or otherwise removable so that when you make the 5 by 10 version the weld in between the two 5 by 5 sections serves as a structure you only need to support it on the ends now why can you not have that middle spacer because it will be in the way of the torch so you need to remove that um, you see the spacer removed here so gantry does not hit the spacer so now in the 5 by 10 case you've you've allowed for a way to move the entire gantry so what's the change that you have to do uh, to go from 5 by 5 to 5 by 10 every single part is identical the only replacement is now you've got another section of table and you've got instead of the five foot long one inch rods you're going to need 10 foot one inch rods so you replace those rods uh, if you're in production, you would take those rods to build the next 5x5 five five section. So actually, in this, uh, actually, to upscale, you reuse the 5x5s. Five well, actually, you already use them, so we don't need them. We save them for the next project. Um, now, I did mention the idea that these, if you use the plain 1-inch solid cold-rolled steel rods upon which the universal axis glides, uh, first of all, it's it's using right now. We're using brass bushings as the gliding surface Probably in the future. We might print nylon bushings with high temperature heated bed printers uh, That's to be replaced those bushings right now cost about two dollars each. So that's perfectly fine for still low-cost precision drive uh, medium precision drive um, okay, but there's one detail here about the sag. So the sag we want, we do want to address because this will sag on you. Mm. And you can, that's workable if you do slow cutting. 
because just because it's sagging the bed level correction which is part of this automated system the the height correction which we are using the exact same probe as on the 3d printer to sense the height of the material uh, from your your work tool uh, that would correct it in itself but you would be limited because if you're gonna try to go fast the things gonna wobble on you if say you're cutting very thin steel like 1 8 inch you want to go fast uh, if you're cutting half inch it's it's up to 20 inches per minute figure that in metric 20 inches per minute is pretty slow it's like that you probably do that but if you want to do faster cutting you wouldn't get away with that sag which is a little unstable so here the the case to do would be to put a support angle uh, say a three by three inch by quarter inch support angle the whole length welded to the gantry to the frame of the gantry and then put a bearing or such underneath the carriage so this is the carriage here um, so we've got the carriage here that's sliding left and right uh, with the that's the torch head so this is sliding left and right uh, so under the carriage there you will add yourself a little roller that glides on your your uh, angle support and that way it's held um, now the only consideration there is spatter from the torch table you can get volcano spot spatters like just metal flying all over the place when you're piercing for example piercing metal uh, but this is actually is on the so one note about this is the gantry is on the outside of the frame and further if we attach the metal angle there it'll be hiding the roller from any other spatter side so it's pr fully protected on the other side so because you have to if you have a roller there you either put it on like a, a rail, but you can also put it right on a flat surface as long as that surface keeps clean. People put it typically like V-groove bearings on a some kind of a, a vertical piece of metal or something. So you're, you're riding a groove on a piece of metal. Here we can be riding a simple ball bearing like a, like a skateboard ball bearing on a flat, on a flat angle piece as long as you can keep dirt out of that so you know like if stuff is in a sh if you're in a shop and you got people grinding you can probably get sp get like dirt on it from the other side too so probably we want to make that roller on a surface from which dirt would come up so basically put it on a rail of some sort not a flat probably to, to make it more robust, yeah. Because, I mean, say you got people grinding on, on metal with 15-amp grinders, those sparks and little pieces end up flying all over, and you can get the the rail dirty here. So, yeah, I mean, this is a work heavy, heavy fabrication workshop. Um, if you have an absolutely clean environment, or you are you willing to clean off the rail once in a while, that's fine, but you wanna you wanna make this maintenance free. Yeah, yeah, you could do various things, uh, but rather than that, just do a do a structure, do a rail like a vertical rail upon which your your bearing glides, so that you never have to worry about dirt resting on top of that surface on which you're you're riding. So that's that's a consideration. So okay, so let's zoom out a little bit. Um, to here so I think the idea is pretty clear we've got the waterbed we've got the structure for the workpiece we've got the gantry section on top the universal axis let's talk about how we mount the universal axis so this is a one inch universal axis what we're showing here is just the long well whichever one axis we're looking at uh, but on top of that we need to put in the transverse axis so say this is the y direction we need the x direction. Which How do we do that? that Let's call the y the long direction. The, the page you're looking at. Right now I'm looking at 11. Uh, okay, so uh, let's go to 13 actually. I put some notes on how, it, how that would look. Uh, so let's have the x right on top horizontally. That's, that's the concept I was, I was thinking about. 
for now. So you can, now that way you're above the frame, so the frame's not in a way. But actually it turns out it has to be below because you actually some, some details about that uh, would not work. Can you tell me what would not, okay, this is a quiz here, what would not work about this? if you're paying attention to the fact that we put together two. So this is, uh, imagine this is a 10 foot long version. What would not work about this with the X writing on, X writing on top? Remember that there's a, we welded two frames together and that cross beam is there. So you're not going to go through that. You need to put it on the bottom. You see that? So another, yeah. so if you go back to slide 11, what I'm actually showing there, um, that's not a, that's actually an important detail. That's the gantry below, so you're not hitting into the transverse piece of the gantry of the frame. So using this artifact here, where the gantry, the x-axis is below, not on top. And the waterbed is on top, not below, is what allows you to attain the scalability. So think about that. Uh, that will become clear once we start doing the CAD. Um, but that's the main consideration. So we just address the x-axis and the y-axis. Now what do we do for the z-axis? So let's go to the torch details. So page, page number 7. So let's take a look at a torch. So let's look at a torch anatomy. Um, so First of all, we're not using a machine torch, a three-hose torch. We're using a standard off-the-shelf cutting torch, which we're going to modify. Why? Uh, because the machine torches, they're rather expensive. They're $300 and up, $500 or so, there's $700. Uh, you can get a torch handle that cuts 7-inch steel for about 60 bucks. So let's work with this uh, to keep the cost down. A torch like this, the, the kind we got, and you can see, the, I'll show you the link, it's got three it's it's one of the style where it has three tubes in it and you can hard you, you don't see that in here let's show a picture where you see three tubes okay here's a three tube torch on page six and what we have it's actually called a positive pressure positive pressure refers to you can read more about that the fact that the the deal is it's got three tubes one is acetylene and two are oxygen. One oxygen is the cutting oxygen. The other oxygen is just the mixing oxygen, which gets you a clean flame with acetylene. So acetylene by itself is a yellow flame. When you add oxygen, it becomes a blue flame. And when you hit the cutting flame, the cutting oxygen, that's the part that actually cuts. So the mixture of oxygen and, and acetylene heats the metal. The cutting lance cuts. So that's the concept of an oxygen lance lance as in a cutter. Uh, that's used in like metal works when they do an oxygen lance to say get impurities out of a molten pool of metal. It applies here in terms of just cutting metal but it's a powerful oxidizer. Once the metal is hot at 2000 C or close to that wherever it melts, I think the melting point is like 22,200 and up. Once you're near the melting point you can ignite that readily. Metal burns. It burns like wood <laughs> when you're at high temperatures. But you need pure oxygen to make that happen. So high temperature plus oxygen, uh, steel melts like a stick of wood, uh, burns like a stick of wood. And that's the principle here. So we've got a three-hose torch. Um, in the torch, so, so that's the deal. You can look at, look at the, that in more detail, study that page. Uh, but basically, in a torch anatomy, you've got a handle. Typically, you depress the handle to, to activate the cutting lance. In our system, here's what we're doing. We're taking our three-hose three torch, cutting it in half, connecting solenoids and, and flexible tube, tubes to it, mounting the handle part on a carriage, adding an oxygen solenoid, acetylene solenoid, and a cutting solenoid. So these are all things that we're going to control by ramps marlin. Yes, victory for open source. So that's easily doable with the RAMPS 1.4 board, the same system that does the 3D printing. We can automate the cutting such that there's three different modes of operation. One, you're cutting. That's the oxygen lance with all three gases. 
one number one is just turn on the acetylene with an igniter so you're gonna have one on the acetylene on everything else is off second case is when once it's lit you turn on the mixing oxygen so you get a clean flame for heating and the third one is all the three channels three pipes are open so you're cutting now in order to save gas for example in tran uh, transit moves uh, just moving from one place to another just turn everything off save gas uh, so and then you can ignite it because this system has an automatic igniter we can move without any gas so turn everything off move so this is gonna be pretty sweet once we see it in action I, and I hope that that all is works like we we think it should because I don't really see a lot of the professional systems when I, the ones I've seen they just keep the gases on and move to a new place I don't really know why uh, we'll try here to turn them off save gas and then just ignite them when we're ready to cut I think that's cleaner and better and saves gas so what we'll have is the carriage will we'll mount the gas the the one part of the handle the, the main part so now for the the only thing we're gonna to have to modify in that outside of cutting is to depress the handle which allows the cutting oxygen to go through um, we're gonna replace essentially the handle we're gonna keep it in a depressed position so put a spring on it just lock it down and the cutting solenoid is what's gonna turn that, ga that gas on but it's critical here that you have a three hose torch that's how you can control all this automatically Maybe you use it as a, an extra security with a magnet coupling or something that you can cut so uh, it cuts the fuel. Uh, yeah, sure, you can the, do that. Uh, the cutting. Next version. Yeah. yeah, for now, the minimum viable product would even be that, like, okay, so we've got three, three solenoids. It's complicated enough. But what would be the minimum viable product here? We can do even a thing where we turn the oxygen and acetylene and light it no automatic igniter we light it turn the two gases on you're good to go then the only thing we want to control well you could even do the when a torch table moves you depress the cutting handle so you can have a semi automated system where all the motion happens but you're actually there watching the torch and pressing the lever for cutting when it gets to, into position we did that's what that's what we actually did do in the 2011 prototype or in the production run there of the tractor parts you're there it moves rather slowly so when it gets into the position you flip the handle and it starts cutting here we're we're doing an operation where you can pretty much walk away from it um, there's probably an operator that's going to be there to to watch what's happening you'll be in the shop but you can actually be doing other things you don't have to sit on it turn it on when it needs to cut so it's fully automated uh, an operator would be there just to make sure everything is going right or maybe change uh, put on new work material and stuff like that uh, but this allows you to be active doing some other things in the shop while you're cutting so you're increasing your productivity uh, by virtue of automation so we can as we deploy this test one by one we can say okay now we're going to test just the system with the cutting oxygen but the rest is moving just in a, in a as we get this built over the week we can just say oh we'll test the first solenoid first and then make sure everything works with that we'll add the next two ones once we test that so we can go okay here's cnc control with marlin and ramps and we're using the cutting solenoid and maybe like even before we put on the cutting solenoid uh, we make sure that the automation part of motion with manual turn on works it's that's called like test driven prototyping just every single step that you build in you test it mm -hmm. don't build the whole system mm -hmm. and then test it all at once test one piece at, after another and also as we're designing this another person can actually be testing the gas system with Marlin so we can certainly divide this task into many many tasks many tasks from CAD to prototyping the igniter like first of all figure out exactly how far from the 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 nozzle does the igniter have to have have to be note also so we've got an igniter next to the the torch we've got a height sensor like on a 3d printer far from it in it 
in this example here, I'm, I'm spacing the actual height sensor, and that would have to be behind a metal, you want to probably put a, like a metal shield behind it, because when you're igniting, you're going to get the flame shooting off to the sides when you're piercing. So you want to protect the height sensor behind a metal shield. Does the igniter have to retract after ignition? I don't have it in this one. I don't have it re retracting. I have it, and this is the kind of testing we want to do. Like if you've got pure acetylene gas flowing all over the place, the igniter could be quite a bit away because that gas is, as long as you catch a little bit of that, the gas, mm. everything ignites, right? So that igniter, in this example here, I have on page number seven, I have it three inches away from the actual torch, which if you have that, you don't need to protect that. That's a high temperature element. Mm. So I think that'll be perfectly fine. And I have the height sensor away from that further because that's more sensitive. It's got a plastic tip on it. But I think between a metal shield and the fact that it can be up to eight millimeters above, and once you start cutting, it's all cool because it's all going into the water. So mm. only during the piercing time do you get any heat traveling to the height sensor. So the way this gas, the, the gas ignition system works here, uh, I would propose, and this is all to be catted up, this is the concept, so put the handle on top, attach hoses, uh, so this, uh, what's missing here is the z-axis, so I didn't draw in the z, obviously the, uh, the gantry with a carriage, that's fixed z-height, so on this carriage we would have to mount a z-axis, where I propose we simply do two y-axes, one x, and y, one z, so that's non-symmetric, we don't like non-symmetry, but because this is one inch axes, I think that will give us plenty of strength. Uh, for stability. Um, if we use the one inch axes, the travel only has to be up to six inches. That should be fine. Uh, what we did before on the circuit mill is support with a double Z axis for symmetry and more mm -hmm. stability. Don't think we necessarily need it here. It's a non-contact operation. Mm -hmm. So we should be fine with one Z axis. So here, the next step on this is, of course, to CAD it up, get all the parts into CAD and put them on, make some mount for the, some kind of a 3D printed mount for the handle. Um, for the part with the, with actual tut cutting bit, we want to put that on a piece of metal. You don't want to put any plastic there. So there, like everything around the flame area, outside of the uh, height sensor, which has a plastic part, everything else will be pretty much metal there. Mm -hmm. So we have to figure all that out. Uh, so that's um, that's what we've got. Uh, here's some of the gas delivery parts. You got these small solenoids on page eight. Um, there's going to be a, a T barb tubing. The only other thing to pay attention to here is we're going to use external stepper drivers, meaning we're going to use the ramps board, but from the little stepper driver sockets, we're going to run two wires into these larger stepper drivers, and that we've done that before. So there's the wire, general wiring diagram for that. But basically, these external stepper drivers, we probably want to put them, if we have the control panel, we probably want to use, we have to think about how we're going to mount the control panel somewhere, um, probably at the top of the torch table. We're going to have an LCD screen to start jobs. Uh, these will have to be mounted, maybe like a second, maybe we can even use the same control panel, just mount all the external stepper drivers on that. How many do we need? We're going to need three axis systems, so you're going to need three of these. Three external strep steppers. We can probably fit them somewhere, maybe like maybe modify the existing control panel to be an auxiliary panel for a torch table. Because so, mm -hmm. we've got the control panel that's 3D printed, 4D printed. Um, so we need <coughs> three of these. They have their own power supply. This is, uh, this is 24 volts. So we're going to need a 24 volt power supply. Right now, the small 24 volt power supply on our main control panel won't handle the larger stepper motors. I don't think it might, because these motors are still running only about, no, actually, no, no, they are. They're running three amps. Uh, so each motor, if each motor runs three amps at 24 volts, mm. yeah. Uh, 
I'm not sure it's it's not exactly 72 watts I think it's about 30 watts mm -hmm. or so uh, for how much it uses because it's only a, it's pulsing the electricity mm -hmm. so I think the motors we're using are about 30 watts each or so uh, 30 40 around there uh, but that's more than a we have a total of 100 watts available from the small power supply so uh, if we optimize that like you know next iteration if we optimize we might be able to use the tiny tiny power supply for the three stepper motors but for now let's use an external power supply so we connect that to this driver and connect the stepper motors to it and connect the signal just the signal wires from the universal controller go to this and mm -hmm. from there it handles the rest of the power uh, any other details um, oh yeah so in the last version what you see here on page 18 is that we use metal plates in order to make the structure stronger in this case, I don't think we necessarily have to do that because that also complicates the, the actual structure significantly. When you have mounting plates and bolts through them, that's uh, much harder. So instead what we have for D3D V9, uh, torch table V1910, CNC torch table 1910, um, yeah, right, okay, so right now if you look in the parts library, we've got uh, the motor piece which is uh, already good to go like you see similar in the pictures what you see on the motor piece for example is that this can accept either NEMA 17 or NEMA 23 motors right now we're using 23 NEMA 23 we're also gonna these are modified to accept 15 millimeter belt so instead of using 6 millimeter belt multiples thereof we'll use one 50 millimeter wide GT2 belt which has 10 micron resolution so we still have 10 micron resolution on the actual drive uh, the limiting factor is going to be the kerf of the torch cut for how accurate we actually get the cuts in the steel. Uh, in this, um, in the current iteration here, we've got the idler piece also ready, uh, ready to go. For the carriage piece, um, we'll see what we have, but I think so far we have this piece which we used last time, which was mounted with plates basically two small pieces mounted with plates together it's not showing up this one um, if we let's actually download that so so that's I think we might have to do some work on on the the carriage module because I think we'd want to do since now we're going to be printing with one millimeter nozzles and printing is going to be fast let's just integrate it into one piece so it's less moving parts less bolts uh, let's see let's download the last one uh, yeah, those are the 2017 files. So yeah, we'd want to modify this to join those two pieces together. So right now, if you look at my screen here, sharing still. The carriage module is basically... Uh, in the picture here, we're, we're using two 3D printed pieces in the greenish and then the metal binding around that. Uh, we want to just do it all a 3D printed piece since we now have faster printing with the one millimeter nozzles. Um, and the way that looks if we go into FreeCAD. So yeah, that's exactly what it is. The, you see the two metal plates um, and the small the 3D printed pieces. So there you have the standard, the belt hole, the, uh, you use a belt peg to hold the belt. And here it's a little, um, yeah, just turn this into one piece. That, that would be the CAD task for us. Um, here what we're showing too is if you remove the plates, uh, if you take a look at one of these pieces. So one of these pieces accepts the, the brass bushings. Uh, so that's what we use here. Uh, that's that's got a good fit, but yeah. So we'll work on modifying this to make it into uh, a single piece. I think beyond that, let's see if there's any other details to cover. Um, in a working dock, I covered a little sacrificial piece, torch holder, general concept, more details about this is the actual torch we've got. Uh, so you can take a look at those links. Oh yeah, here's a on slide 24. There's actually a very nice guide. I pasted this. I found a, a resource guide on cutting quality. How do you tell your cut is really good? And a perfect cut should be super clean. Um, 
you can go through all the different cases where there's different like either spat slag on the top or bottom or like a more rounded edge it should be a nice clean square cut uh, so you can read through those examples there and let's see anything else we've got the the external stepper driver the basic geometry of gas delivery uh, details of the torch handle how that looks so that's the actual picture of what we're using the three three tube three hose torch modified for $59 from Harbor Freight it's about it so let's get to the design we'll start on the CAD so we'll we'll hit the CAD what we want to do in the next two days and people remotely if you're listening to this join us we're going to be catting up and if you actually want to do an experiment of remote collaboration you can go to the wiki at CNC Torch Table 19.10 and we'll include it in this video here. But what you'll see is that we're going to be uploading and downloading this file. So for example, if you click on CNC Torch 1708, so we're still using, I actually did this uh, new version on October 2, modify this. But what you'll see is if there are new version versions, you'll see that appear in file history. So if you're remote, and you want to contribute to this you know obviously you want to contact us so we can coordinate but you can also coordinate independently by just start uploading if you think you, you can design the next what we need here just upload it and it doesn't really hurt if you want to it's actually open edit I mean you can click here upload a new version of this file and you can do it as long as it's under a mag of memory and then if we like it we'll take it if we don't we'll throw up the next version maybe borrow some improvements from you and and put up the next file so you can collaborate remotely through the simple version of history on the wiki as a scalable method of many people collaborating on it so feel free to join us for all these parts this is a po called a part library what we're doing is putting in the pieces here once we have the final assembly the proper workflow would be to start on the final assembly break this down into all the individual pieces and then we can divide that uh, by many people the big point is have a placeholder where you know, okay, if you want the torch holder piece, okay, here it is. Here's one picture here in a visual gallery, so you can readily identify it and download it. You don't have to wade through a wall of text of file names to see what is what. The, the visual picture here is pretty important. On the top here, this right under the, the heading, uh, what we do is typically just cu cut and paste images of in-progress CAD so that you can more or less trace the design evolution of this of this project so here you can see that maybe we started with this I might have modified it maybe made a modification to do that part the third one um, here you can take a snapshot because that kinda helps people get oriented like how you designed a certain part so feel free to do that other than that uh, yeah feel free to collaborate Email us at info at opensourceecology.org if you want to coordinate. Uh, have someone, I'll respond to that to get you going. Maybe if there's more people, we can get more people doing on parts that there's only three of us here that are working actively on CAD. So if there's other remote people doing this, then uh, that would help. So I think I'll leave it at that. And we're going to continue reporting on this, maybe a report tomorrow as far as how far we got. And join us, help us out. Thanks for listening.